come in confidence, we come in faith, we come, Lord, breaking the powers and strongholds of guilt and condemnation, we come to that place where the rebels come from. And Lord, this day, we, as we come before you, you see the needs here, only you can meet them. And Lord Jesus, we bind and break the strong arm of the enemy that comes against us in our minds. And Lord, we thank you for your compassion, your mercy, and your loving kindness. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen, please. Amen. I'm say. Let's go back and talk some more about rejecting or accepting our prepared place, about these rivers. The last time we left off Sunday night, we were looking at this river that flowed out of uh, the Garden of Eden. And these things that were written for us was not written for us to have history lessons. But the Lord was saying something to us. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. You see, you and I are supposed to be that prepared place, that prepared land. And we're going to see very clearly from Scripture this morning that whenever the Lord had a people, He always prepared a place for them to dwell, a place for His presence, a place where the enemy was rendered powerless. And have you looked around and seen all the Christians whose lives were in shambles, and many have made shipwreck? Am I telling the truth this morning? Amen. Let's go to Genesis 2 and begin there again. And look at some of the things that we looked at over the last two sessions. And whenever God spoke of delivering his people, he always prepared a prepared place for them. Genesis chapter 2, let's begin there again this morning. And begin to see why he prepared us, why he called us. And I want to say something to you. If we're not walking in that place, if we're not walking in that calling that God has given to us, the Lord turns off the water from heaven. Are you listening to me? And we'll see that this morning. And many times we come to him and we say things like, Well, Lord, I would have, but you see, Lord, I was afraid. I was fearful, Lord. Lord, I just didn't have any faith. Well, I sort of doubted, Lord. As long as you don't walk in that place, in that calling that God's called you to, he turns the water off. Say with me. God will turn my water off. <laughs> if I don't do what he called me to do. <laughs> Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And let's pick back up at verse 4. Genesis 2, 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Would you please put a note there and put prepared. Please put prepared. And I want you to please do something with verse 5 so you won't forget it. Because it's one of the most important verses to understand why God created man and what God's intentions were for man. Verse 5 says, Now, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth. Now, you stop and think about that. The earth in heaven is prepared. There's no grasses. There's no shrubs. No shrubbery. It's prepared. Say with me. God has prepared the heavens and the earth. Now watch what it says in verse 5. This is awesome. No shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field of the earth had yet sprouted. Why? For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and, and, please underline this, there was no man to, what's that next word in your Bible? Rose I couldn't hear you. Shout out to me. Rose Rose me. I still couldn't hear you. What'd you say? There was nothing there because there was no man to cultivate. Amen. And the word cultivate means to work and to serve. If you have a real good Bible, they will give you that Hebrew meaning of that word. But the nearest word in our language for the Hebrew word that's used there is the word cultivate. But what it literally says is God had not put any grass in the earth, no shrubbery. There was no rain coming upon the earth because there was no man to work and to serve. Are you listening to me? Amen. Now, I want to show you something. Well, let this just continue. I'll just show you later. Verse 6. But a mist used to arise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils, don't miss this, the breath of life. That's what happened to you when you were born again. 
John 20, Jesus came and appeared and breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. He breathed upon them. That was their salvation. Can you say man? Amen. And man became a living being. Man is not prepared. Why is he prepared? To do what? I couldn't hear you. Why is he prepared? He's prepared to work and to serve. You know, I remember when I was in the business world and I was saying I'm born again with the Holy Ghost. You know, I thought it was my business. Made lots of money, but God sent leanings into my soul. Boy, did I have a difficulty understanding spiritual things. But I knew all about business, all about management, all about the ins and the outs, all about planning the sale, all about teaching salesmen how to make a sale. And I would give God just crumbs. You know, every little spare moment I get, well, maybe I'll pray on the way to work. God don't receive scraps. Amen. Are you listening to me? Amen. I was working and serving all right, but I wasn't working and serving the purpose that God called me to work and serve in. So there was no rain from heaven. There was no open heaven. Revelations and visions were very far and few and in between. Every now and then God would send something, another crumb my way, trying to bring me back to that river. We talked about the four rivers that flow out of Eden, but there's only one that you should be camped by. Amen? Amen. Which river do you want to be camped by? Pisha. What does Pisha mean? You think you forgot so quickly? What does Pisha mean? Everybody tell me. What does it mean? I certainly hear. What does it mean? Does God talk about pouring out a blessing upon us we can't contain? Overflowing? That's what Deuteronomy 28 is all about, the first 14 verses. Overflowing. And whenever we're walking in rebellion, he moves us from that place to another place. Walking more rebellion, you get moved from that place to another place. That place or another place. If you stay in rebellion, he puts you out of his presence altogether. Think about these people that are lying doctors, once saved, always saved. Then you just come to church and sit down and sit in a pew, sing a few songs, you know, a 15 minute sermon, go out in the world, and don't worry about anything but just love the world. You're deceived. Amen. Let me show you a scripture in Isaiah 58 that goes with this. Most of us know about Isaiah 58. But I'm telling you something, people. God does not lie. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Notice with me, please, the 11th verse. Say with me. I will save, I will save. and kidnap from the world, from the world. By, the by the Spirit of God. I come into God's kingdom. To work and to serve. To work and to serve. We hear lots of gospel in these last days about blessings and prosperity. And I want you to know something. Prosperity got a scale of being to that of the world. And God talks about prosperity, talks about the prosperity that comes from heaven. That, that water, that rain that makes us fruitful, that we can multiply and increase. In Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord gives a promise here and he says... And the Lord will continually do what to you? Right. Guide you. Now don't miss this. And satisfy your desire in what kind of places? Right. Let me tell you something. All of hell can break loose on you. Amen. And here's a promise in the word of God that says that he will still give us our desire. What's our desire? Amen. His presence. Amen. His anointing. Amen. Did you say amen? amen? Doesn't matter what you're walking through. He will be with you. There's a promise here. That's what he's talking about. This person is capped by Pishon. What's the, who is Pishon? Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus. He's the fountain of living waters. Amen? Amen? Let's continue here. He goes on and he says, He will give strength to your bones. Your bones here is a, a symbolic. It means your foundation. Your foundation in him. And he goes on to say, and you will be like a what kind of garden? Water. Watered garden. Now, David talks much about being like a watered garden. He talks about in Psalms 1. So does Joshua in Joshua 1. He talks about us being like trees planted by rivers of water. Is that right? 
McGon wrote that, folks. He wasn't writing that to people involved in farming. He was writing to his people. He was talking about the rains of heaven. He wasn't talking about the waters on the, on the, on the earth. Amen? He says, you'll be like a water garden. You will be like a spring of water whose waters do not do what? Fail. They don't fail. See, I talk to people all the time. They say, I pray to God. I can't get my prayers answered. Do you know the voice of God? No, I don't know the voice of God. But let me tell you something. They major in knowing the voice of the enemy. Now, don't forget what we saw last week in the, in the last two sessions. Water, we saw very clearly, is also words. Is that right? Amen. So God will continue to lead you and guide you. He will say, no, no, this is the way walk ye there in it. And they'll say, Satan told me this, Satan told me that. Oh, you, gotta, you, gotta, you can't buy another river. Amen. That's the river that's talked about in Revelation 12. It says very clearly, he opened his mouth and a flood came out. That's the wrong water. That's the wrong source. But when the Lord prepared us, he prepared us to be close to him. Remember what we saw last week in Jeremiah? He made us to cling to him like a waistband on a land. Is that right? Yes. To stay close to him. Jesus told me, he said, how often I wanted to gather you. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets. I want to gather you, he said, the way a hen gathers a chick under her wings. He wants us close to him. Oh, there is that watering hole. We saw in Ezekiel last week. There's waters. There's also swamps and marshes. It's wet too. And when you're tormented by demon powers, when the powers of hell are breaking loose upon you, you are camping in the swamps and the marshes. We saw very clearly in the book of Joel that the demon powers can only come where there's no water and where there's no rain. Can you say amen today? We get some understanding why so many people are pressed. Ask yourself where you can be. Ask yourself what has your heart. What's top priority in your life? Is it really the Lord Jesus? Is it his will? Is it your job? What is it? <coughs> because what's top priority in your life determines where you can. Let's continue. Let's see what this man's doing. That's like this water garden. He's like a water, a spring of water whose waters fell not. Uh, there's one chair up front here, Patrick, and there's one over here. There's two up front over here. <coughs> this is what he says. He goes on after talking about these water, this person that's like a water brook. He says, and those from among you will rebuild the what kind of ruins? The ancient ruins is, is bringing back to the people of God the narrow way. And the narrow way don't have a hill of beans to do with religion or some church organization. He says, you will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called the repairer of the what? Breach. Everybody said the breach. Now somebody tell me, what is this breach God's talking about? Huh? Broken fellowship. Perfect word. The Lord said, your sin have made a separation between you and your God. His hand is not so short. His ear is not so dull. But it's your sins, he says. That's the breach. There's a gap there. Are oh, you listening to me? Yeah. You see, we talk about this river of the Euphrates drying up. About all these millions of horsemen coming through. That's why I took my time for studies ago and showed you. They have a thing to do about China. Talking about demon powers being turned loose. You ain't never saw a horse with a head like a lion, have you? <coughs> Go back and reread your Bible. The river dried up. What does the word Euphrates mean? Did you write down your Bible last week? Talk to me. It means it's what kind of waters? Sweet water. It's sweet waters. God says, I will dry up the sweet waters that I've been sending to you. That's when the horse went right through. When Joel talked about the Russian city, he said. They run on the wall, he said. John the Revelator said it in the ninth chapter of Revelation. He said when that fifth angel blows his trumpet, that's when the water brook is beginning to be turned off. And that's where we are in time. We've gone through six trumpets, and most of the church world don't even believe it. Don't even believe it. They're busy watching the stock market and watching Israel. They, they watch Jesus, Amen. amen. 
But let's find out what this person is doing. He talks some more about this person. He says in verse 10, If you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness. Your gloom, the worst day of your life, will become like midday. And what do we know about this person? Huh. He's about some waters. He's capping about some waters. Say with me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, search my heart today. Search my heart today. Bring me right back to that place. Bring me right back to that place. You first called me to. You first called me. Let me camp a while at Pishon. Let me camp a while at Pishon. Jesus, that's you. Jesus, that's you. That, glory to God, it sure is. Amen. 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 <laughs> Let me show what he goes on to say very clearly. He says in verse 6, This is the fast which I choose, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bonds of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. He said, is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light will, he says, break out in like the dawn. Your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your real God, which means no enemy can even ambush you from the back. If you don't remember, in the first two sessions, we saw very clearly in Genesis, Eden was a place that the water surrounded. He said, said, I'll surround you with protection. Does the Bible talk about the angels of God encamped among those that fear him? Yeah, how about that? Amen. It's been your call, and Lord will answer. He said, you get some answer prayers when you're doing this. Amen. You will cry, and he'll say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the point of the finger, and speaking wickedness. That's the place that's next to the Father's heart to bring in the lost, to go in the highways and edges and compel them to come in, to give yourself away. Amen? Well, let's look at one more place, please. Let's go back to Genesis 2 and look at these rivers again for those that weren't here. And out of the ground, the thing with this too. Before we go back to Genesis, let's go back to John 14. If I had you holding two places, I just remember that. Jesus died. And that was a reason that he died. He didn't die for you to stay lost. He didn't die for you to stay demon oppressed. He didn't die for you to stay sick. He didn't die for you to stay in bondage. Can you say amen? amen. He did not die for you to be tormented. He died to prepare a place for us. That's what John 14 is all about. The Lord says in John 14, very clearly through John's writing, Let not your heart be troubled. we got people all the time talking about they're worried or they're fearsome. He tells who to believe in. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, the Father's house for your information is God's kingdom, are many dwelling places. The King James is an arrow. He used the word mansions. The word is dwelling places. Get your, get your strongest concordance and look it up. If it was not so, he says, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Is that, are those words in your Bible? Yes. Well, let me remind you of something. Where was Jesus about to go when he told him this? He was headed. Where was he headed? Wait a minute, before he went to heaven, though, where did he have to go first? Right. Let's not make it take a shortcut. We sure need him, don't we? He was about to die, folks. He was on his way to Calvary, folks. And so he says to them, I'm going somewhere to prepare a place for you. I'm about to lay down my life that you may have a place to dwell with the Father. In my Father's house, he says, or many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go, he says, to prepare a place for you. This is what he says. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be, what's that next word? Oh. Also. Say with me. God wants me close to him. God wants me close to him. God wants me near him. God wants me near him. And you know what's amazing about this description? Just like most of us, his disciples didn't have any idea in the world what he was talking about. Every time God has a people, whether in bondage, whether they're backslidden, whether they're bound by demon powers, or like it says in the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, 
They can be at the very end of the earth, which means they're about to plunge into hell. And they look back and turn back to God and say, Lord, help me, remember me. I'm not talking about these people who live their lives in filth and then wait to get on their deathbed and die. That's why I read in that book last week of what uh, John Bunyan saw. How the demons talk and say, this person was so stupid to believe they could wall around in filth all their life and wait to get on their deathbed and go to heaven. And the demons said, why does anybody want to serve the enemy and then when they die, go to heaven? Even the demons understood that. Are you listening to me? So Jesus says, I'm just going to die. There's a reason I'm about to die. God, when he brings the people to any place, always, always, he will first himself, God will do the work. Say with me, God must do everything in me. God must take out of me what's not like him and place into me his character and nature. I'm totally helpless. Let me tell you something. He only does that when you're camping by pie shop. As you draw near to him, every time you go near to him, every time you call upon him, he takes something out of you. And he'll add something of himself back into you. That's why John the Baptist said, he must increase so I can decrease. Amen. You can try with willpower. You can try by fasting and prayer. If you're not calling on the Lord, folks, listen to me. Deliverance by man, the Bible says, is in vain. The race is not given to the swift. It's not given to the strong. It ain't even given to one that wills. But it's given to one that God shows mercy. So I took my time to show you last week. This water stands for his mercy, his compassion. This water stands for his restoration. This water stands for his reviving. It's his healing and deliverance. The powers of hell cannot come anywhere while the water's off. Oh, you're listening to me. Let's go back to Genesis 2. Do you want to camp by those waters? Talk to me. Say, I can tell you by that stream of water. The streams of God, he says, is full of water. See, most of us had no idea what it meant when he was pierced into his side and blood and what else flowed out? Oh, I wonder what that was happening there. You thought the soldier was just angry? Why would a, a soldier, no man is dead, do something like that? Don't you know God was saying something to us? When if I should tell you this morning, I'll tell you tonight. If I tell you tonight, you tell me back tonight. Mm -hmm. I know. Get all you can get. <laughs> well, if you want to know about it, it's in John 19. Don't turn there, 33 through 34. Wait, let's look at it, if you want to see it. Did you wonder why he said, he said, you eat my flesh and drink my blood? Did you wonder what David meant when he said the prayer of the table for me in the presence of my enemies? What did David mean when he said his cup's running over? Where was he camping? He said, I don't fear you without pass the battle of the shadow of death. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside steel waters. Where are you camping, David? Where are you camping, folks? This is what he says here. Well, Go to John 19. Is this making sense to you yet? If you want here, get the first two tapes. We've got a lot of foundation in those two tapes. In 19th chapter of John, verse 33. Let's read through verse 34. Here the Lord writes to us by the Holy Ghost and coming to Jesus when they saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a what? Spear and, what's that next word? Immediately. I mean, I want you to know immediately. <laughs> by the way, this happened right after Jesus said, it's finished. Did you know that? <laughs> He makes sure all those scriptures are fulfilled, but he, he says, hey, I'm thirsty. Because remember, one scripture hadn't been fulfilled. <laughs> and he said, it's finished. And then all of a sudden, this, this happens. They come to him. They know he's dead already. They don't break his legs. And he pierces his side. Now the price has been paid. The sacrifice has been made. And something interesting now happens. And the Bible says immediately, blood and water came out of his side. 
Everybody say, immediately. Immediately. Oh, that's such an important word. That's what it says here. And there came out blood and water. And you wonder why he called himself the fountain. <laughs> and who has seen has borne witness, and his witness is true. And he knows that he said the truth, so that you may also believe. For these scriptures, these things came to pass, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they did what to? Yes. Pierced. Why was he pierced? Does the Bible say this soldier pierced his side? Let me show you the fulfillment of this was prophesied. Go to Zechariah for a moment. Zechariah 13. Let me ask you a question. If you're a saint of God, do you ever call upon the Lord? Talk to me. Amen. Are you looking upon him whom they have pierced? Amen. Do you know also that your sins pierced him to that cross? Amen. In Zechariah, the 13th chapter, I want you to see with me about a fountain that's going to be opened up. Zechariah, the 13th chapter. And let's look, please, at verses 1 through verse 3. Zechariah 13. These new Bibles. One page turns at a time. Let's begin at verse 12, chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and on the inhabitants of what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The spirit of what? Grace. grace. Somebody help me. What is grace? God's power. What else is it? His anointing. What else is it? His strength. What else is it? His authority. His dominion. Is that right? Amen. And he says very clearly, I will pour out upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. If you think that's for just the Jews, folks, you got a Bible there with a book of Hebrews in it. And it says very clearly in the 12th chapter that when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've come to Mount Zion, you've come to the, the heavenly Jerusalem, you also have a Bible there that has the book of Galatians in it. The third chapter and the fourth chapter, Paul says very clearly that we're not born from below, we're born from above. Jerusalem above is our mother. And the Bible says very clearly through Paul's revelation that when you come to Jesus, you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. Paul also writes in Philippians, the third chapter, and he says very clearly that, we're, that we are citizens and we're looking for the Lord. Is that right? Amen. That we're not of this wrath. We are citizens of a whole different country. Is that right? Amen. So it says something is going to happen here. And he says very clearly, they will mourn for him as only one mourns for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of our firstborn. Now, I want to skip on now. You can study verses 11 through 14, and you'll find out that each of us have to cry out for ourselves. Oh, you listen to me. And then it says in verse 13, In that day, a fountain will be opened up. Can I help you? When that man pierced his side, folks, the fountain got opened up. Will be opened up for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For what purpose? Sin and what else? Impurity. Let me ask you a question. If that's for heaven, is there anybody walking around in sin and impurity in heaven? No. 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 <coughs> oh, you stand before that fountain. And it will come about. And that day declares all of those. Notice God has to do the work that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land. Is that in your Bible? Amen. Does it say that he will cut them off? Yes. The idols are lust, anger, greed. You can just go on and on and on and on. Slander, gossip. They have a name. They're idols. If you're bound to anything, God calls it an idol. Now I shared with some people yesterday. How about took me when, when he showed me something. And showed me when he bound the angels there in Jude. He bound them with their sins. That's how we're bound also. And so when you die, what you're bound with, all Satan does is come and takes a hook and hooks into what you're bound with and drags you up into hell. And that's why God has to break the, the sin habits. Because 
every sin habit is how much stronger than we are. Seven. Seven times stronger than we are. I don't care how late it is. So he says, but there's going to be a fountain open up for sin and impurity. What does God say for us to do? Confess our sins and keep doing them? No. no. He tells them Proverbs, the one that confesses his sins and turns from his sins, he finds what? Mercy! So when you say, Lord, I'm turning from this thing, and I'm confessing, Lord, it's stronger than I am. It's greater than I am. And Lord God, you must break it, oh God. And Lord, you're the sacrifice, and I'm accepting the sacrifice. Then and only then, you become unbound. Oh, you listen, gentlemen. Amen. But I'm getting away from my message showing you all this stuff. I, let me just write, just write these down. In John 6, 56, Jesus said, Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any life in you. Can I tell you something? Are you receiving the word of God today? Amen. Talk to me. Are you receiving the word of God today? Amen. You are eating his flesh. Right now, you are eating his flesh. Job said it best. The ears taste words like the mouth tastes meat. Peter says, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you taste it, if you taste it, you're eating his word, you're eating his flesh, you're drinking his blood, but tell you, say, Lord, help me, forgive me, deliver me, restore me, revive me, heal me, wash me. <laughs> Why do you think he washed their feet? He has to wash our lives. He said, if I don't wash your foot, Peter, you don't have any part with me. Oh, do you want to part with him? Then you bring your life to the Lord, wash my life. Your feet always represent the lifestyle that you walk and practice daily. Jesus, be my foot washer, Lord Jesus. Wash my feet, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, may worship at your feet, Lord Jesus. <coughs> Cleanse me, Jesus. I can't deliver myself, Jesus. By the way, you remember those 80 prayers we showed you in Psalms 119? Yeah. Those prayers and those requests were the workings of that water of the Spirit for our deliverance and our completion. That's the water. Oh, you listen to me. You're going to take your Bible sometime and just take it before the Lord and where the things you got marked is the Lord, here's a source. Here are the prayers to pray for. Every deliverance you need is listen to Psalms 119. Well, here's a source. I'm at the river, Lord. Lord, I'm asking, Lord. Deliver me, Lord. What am I talking about? The prayer place. The place of cleansing. A place of deliverance. A place of restoration. A place of breaking all bondage and sin habits. God prepared a place for every human being, no matter who he is or what he's ever done. And then he said, you may now come. I've done the work. Let's go back to Genesis. Are oh, you still following me so far? Amen. Now, God's prepared the heaven and the earth. Now he's placed a man there whom he had formed. And why is he there? To work and to serve. And out of the ground... The Lord God calls to grow. Oh, who calls it to grow? Oh, how about that? Seems like God must do it all, doesn't it? <laughs> Every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. Then we come to verse 10. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. And the name of the first is Pishon, which means what again? Overflowing. It flows, when the word there flows is the word surround. It surrounds the whole land of Halava where there is gold. Oh, you sing that song this morning. And for brass, I'll give thee gold. Is that right? Amen. And what's, what's on the line of that song? For iron, I'll give you silver. Let me tell you something. When you sin, he takes away the gold and he gives you brass. And brass always stands for what? Yeah. Judgment. Why do you think his feet are like bronze? Judgment. Who is this, he says, that comes from Basra? Lord, why are your robes stained? Remember when we went through all that? <clears throat> Around this place of Pishon, overflowing. That's what Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14 is about. A person that camps at that river. The gold means purity. 
Only the pure in heart will see God. Say that with me. Only the pure in heart will see God. And God is coming back after a people without spot or wrinkle, without any blemish or defect. If that's true and you believe that, you better be found counted by Pasha. Because that Pasha is also something else. It's the only river like it in all the rivers. Because this river is Jesus. And the goal of that land is good. And the dillium and the onyx stone are there. What's the dillium? Circle dillium with pearl. Is he called the pearl of great price? You see, God uses the term over and over. I will give you a land flowing with milk and honey. Is that right? What color is honey? Gold. How about that? Guess what this next stone's color is? Milk white. The honor stone. And as you go into Revelation, we're going to read all the jewels. And we've talked about what those jewels stand for. You'll discover that this stone is a special stone. It can take any hard impact of hell has and not be crushed or shattered. But see, you're going to be found camping at Pai Shop. Are you listening to me? Amen. And I'm slowly getting my way back to where I was going to teach you today. <laughs> Let's go to Isaiah, the 8th chapter. Now, Mike, because you came away from East Texas, I'm going to give you the rest of these rivers. Gaishan stands for bursting out. And there are times when you first move from that river, you know what God will do to you? He'll put you some waters and he'll just burst against you. What's he doing? You remember what that, that eagle does? You get too comfortable? She starts taking the straw off the nest, doesn't she? All of a sudden, she starts in the rocks, don't you? If that don't get your attention, guess what? You'll slowly be moved. Slowly be moved. So you'll know why they'll put out of Eden. That was a reason. That was a message there. God was saying something to all of us for all time. Did you, want, did you ask yourself, here they were in a garden that God planted. All they had to do was keep the fruit and keep the weeds out and keep the, de the devil out. But then when they rebelled and believed the devil, the devil came in. God was saying something. Now they're in a whole different occupation. And he says to them, from this point on, you have to serve the ground. You will earn your living by the sweat of your brow. You will begin to work the ground. See, I talk to people that say, oh, I remember, Brother Boutte, when I first got saved, oh, it was so wonderful. And I lost that sweet fellowship. You lost the waters. You lost the rivers. But see, we live in a day when God says, I'll restore those years that the locusts and the caterpillars and the pub water came on and eaten up. Did God say that? Amen. <laughs> Tigerus means vehement and bursting out, Mike. And Euphrates means his sweet waters. Okay? In eyes of the eighth chapter, let's begin to look. Let's move forward from where we were last week. It's good to camp there, but let's move on. Amen? Isaiah chapter 8. Look at me, please, at verses 5 through 8. Isaiah 8, verses 5 through 8. Now, I want to show you what happens when you reject God's waters. You ready? Say with me. Every time I commit any act of rebellion, I'm in danger of losing these waters. That's what it's all about. And so we come to the eyes of the eighth chapter. That's what it says. Verse 5. And again the Lord spoke to me further, saying, Inasmuch as these people, and who's he talking about there when he says these people? The people of God. Have rejected the gentle flowing waters of Shiloh. Folks, who is Shiloh? He's Jesus. He's Jesus. Amen? And he goes on to say, And rejoice in Resin and the son of Amelia. Let me tell you about this. What are you saying? He is saying, you've chosen another king. Now, this king 
was a real person. Both of them were. Listen to me. And both of them counseled rebellion against the words of Isaiah. Was Isaiah speaking his words? Whose words was Isaiah speaking? God's words. Is that right? So when the demon powers come to you and say, look, I know God said don't do that. <laughs> and I know you know it's wrong. But you can always do it now and ask God to forgive you later. You're about to lose the waters. Well, Lord, I know that maybe I'm compromising a little bit. You're about to lose the waters. You're listening to another king just like Adam did in the garden. Are you hearing me? Yes. Another stream is coming to your garden. See, Eden is a picture of salvation. A place prepared of God. And we have a responsibility in our salvation to continue to produce the fruit of salvation. Is that right? Amen. Jesus said, you know a tree by its fruit. Can you say amen to that? Amen. He said, a good tree cannot bring forth what kind of fruit? Amen. Oh, a good tree don't bring forth bad fruit. If you got some bad fruit, what waters are you camping by? You're in the swamps and the marshes. Listen to what it says. You reject it, he says. Rejected the gentle flowing waters of Shiloh. The Holy Ghost is described as a still small voice. You rejoice in Rezan and the son of Remaliah. Now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the what? The Euphrates. Even the king of Assyria in all his glory. And it will rise up over all his channels, go over all its banks. Then it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will even reach the neck and spread the, its wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. What does that mean to you? What God is saying? You might give me some terms of what the, all those other waters mean. Let me tell you something. That was no your Euphrates about to overflow. He gave it to him in symbolism. Remember, the Old Testament is in picture form. He explained what he was talking about. He brought the enemy against them, the king of Assyria. And he was saying, the enemy is going to run over everything you got. Why? Because you rejected the sweet waters that were flowing from Shiloh. Now, do you understand that? Yeah. Say it with me. There ain't no such thing as bad luck. Everything that's ever come into my life. Ever since I came to Jesus. God said it. God said it. See, don't believe that scripture. That from God's hand comes light and darkness. It's all designed to do what? Push us right back to that source of the river. See, oh my I was going to take it on another rabbit trail and take it to the book of Job, but he turned the tape over. That means we've already used it 45 minutes. But let me just say what Job said. Can I just quote it for you? Remember what Job said? God says, I'll speak to them once or twice in a dream, in a vision of the night. I'll try to get their attention. But they'll pay no attention. Remember that? He says, then I'll take them and inflict them on a bed of pains and misery and woes. And he said, but if they don't cry out to me, I will let them perish, he says, along with the, with the cult prostitutes. That means they'll go all into hell. A person that came to God. But then he went on to say, but if you cry out to him, he said, he restores back to that place. Is that right? Amen. So, there's a shortcut in the Job. Let's continue. Let's go to Isaiah 7, please. Isaiah 7. Now, let me show you another name for this river that's about to overflow there. I'm going to first tell you and then read it. Another name for this river that's about to overflow there are demon powers. Did you hear me? Amen. Now, if you don't believe it, I'll have to take it to Isaiah 5 and prove it, won't I? Let's continue. Look what he says in Isaiah the 7th chapter, verse 17. The Lord will bring on you and on your people. Now, first he prophesied about them. Assyria coming against them. The Lord will bring upon you and your people and on your father's house such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah 
the king of Assyria. Does he say, I'm going to bring the king of Assyria up against you? It will come about in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that's in the land of Assyria. Can anybody whistle for me? Can't you whistle better than that? Do you understand what God is saying? When you rebel against him, he whistles for the demon powers to come. Oh, you don't believe it? Good. We'll keep reading. <laughs> See, I live in a day, I preach a gospel in a day where people have been put to sleep by false preachers behind pulpits. Amen. Don't worry about it. Demons can't touch you. They can't come to the blood. Listen to me. What do you think the Lord wrote about to Brother Paul over there in Hebrews? About this person goes on sinning willfully after receiving out of the truth. And it's impossible to be, be re renewed. Well, I'm so glad they got better uh, people that can understand Greek and Hebrew now. What God was simply saying is, as long as you're walking in sin, the blood sacrifice that you received of has been made void. Paul said the same thing in Romans. Know that your circumcision has become uncircumcision. What he was talking about. See, we got lots of people that look for an easy way. They want to sleep their way to heaven. It ain't done that way, folks. Amen. This is what he says here. They will all come and sit on the steep ravines, on the ledges of the cliffs, on all the thorn bushes, and on all the what kind of places? Uh-oh, the water just got polluted. Say with me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus keep me at Holliver. Keep me at Pyshaw. Keep, keep, keep me close to your side, Jesus. That's the only place the demon powers can't come. <laughs> That's what he says. In that day, the Lord will shave with a what? Razor. Razor. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh oh. What does it mean when that God's going to shave with a razor? He's going to cut off what? You got it right. Razors are used to shave what? The hair. And what does hair stand for? The glory. Another name for glory is God's anointing. It's God's presence. Now you know why David said to the Lord, Lord, if you don't go with us, we ain't going. You understand that now? He whistles for the bee and the fly. By the way, did you catch that part a while ago when it said, I'm going to send for the fly that's at the remotest part? That means he goes in that hell and pull him out. Say with me. It's holiness. It's holiness. It's righteousness. It's righteousness. It's sanctification. It's sanctification. Or it's hell. Or it's hell. Period. Period. And, and listen to this. <laughs> it says that God hired them. There is no one as sarcastic as God. Loving, yes. Kind, yes. Full of tender mercies, yes. Loves those that love him. His mercy for a thousand generations of those that love him and serve him. Let me tell you something. He'll beat your brains out. Amen. But see, we don't hear that part of God. You know what we want to hear? Paul told us, Timothy, the time will come. They want to do a sound doctrine. They'll heap themselves. Teachers have teachers have the itching ears saying, speak to us smooth words. I like sermons. His voice is too loud. It's always something, you know? <laughs> Negative preaching. They're talking too much about judgment there. I want to hear that God is love, love, love. Listen to me. My God is a consuming fire. Oh, you listen to me. He said, the fear of the Lord, folks. Not be palsy wows with the Lord, folks. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, folks. Amen. And I was, the Lord has been doing something in my life recently, and I was telling him this. He, he said, don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. You know, many times the demon powers will back off a little bit and make you come to a place where you think you've got total peace, and you say, oh, God's done the work. Let me tell you how you fall into that trap many times. How many times have you been praying to God and saying, Lord, deliver me, and God began to bring you deliverance. And all of a sudden, you sort of just slacked off a little bit, and all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you are right back in that same mire again. Never happened to you? That's what I'm talking about. 
And I'm only in a place of such peace right now from heaven. And I said, now, Lord, I don't know if this is from you or not, because I don't know all things, and I'm walking before you in fear and trembling, Lord. Lord, don't let me be deceived by the demon powers that have told me so back off that I'm being duped. I said, keep on if it's you, Lord. Do it even deeper, Lord. Amen. Make it to my foundations, Lord. Are oh, you listening to me? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Say, we wonder why Christians have lives like roller coasters, up and down, up and down. Anyone ever notice that? Amen. And then we put Christians behind everything. Somebody ought to come out with a Christian yo-yo. <laughs> this is what it says. And that day the Lord will shave with a razor. Hired. You think God has to go and, and buy a razor blade? Has to go and buy a razor? You think God wants to shave? He is saying, I'm about to cut my glory off my people. Have you wondered why it's so dry? <laughs> hired, he says. I can't get over that word hired. Can you? Wait, he would tell us where they come from. He says, from regions beyond the Euphrates. Oh, let me ask you a question. When you was reading those rivers a while ago there in Genesis, which one was listed last? Yeah. How about that? That means God went outside of that prepared place and hired something. Could it possibly be demon powers? I'm going to tell you again. Satan has been defeated. Yes. He's Amen. God's errand boy. Amen. In fact, in, in, in uh, Chronicles of Samuel, Satan is called the anger of God. See, we, we, we know we come to church to eat pavla. Some of our teeth have fallen out. We can't stand to eat meat. Yet my Bible keeps telling me, leave these elementary things about water baptism and hang on our hands and go on to maturity. Amen. Where are the mature sons and daughters of God today? Why is it the people of God need to be taught all over again? The elementary principles of salvation. He goes on to say, that's the king of Assyria. The head and the hair of the legs. It will also remove the what else? Yeah. The beard. Are those words in your Bible? Yeah. What God is simply saying is, every place where there's been glory on you, you're about to be stripped. And it wants that God likes in parable form. We're so dumb. Do what it says in verse 23. It will come about in that day that every place where there used to be a thousand vines, Valued at a thousand shekels of silver. What does silver stand for? Salvation. Shout out to him. What does it stand for? Salvation. What does thousand stand for? Completion. Think about it. Said you can't lose it. Once they've always saved, here these vines are. They used to be valued. Used to be valued. Now, ever hear about some wood, hay, and stubble been burned up? He said, will become. Uh-oh. I remember that we were called out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, which means at that place we become sons of light. Is that right? Yeah. Here are some people that had salvation. They're about to become relocated, retransferred, Pastor Ruwata over this morning about if we don't pray the Lord, don't call for his name. God says, I, I, God. See, we don't believe that scripture. Can I show you what that scripture means? Yes. Hold your place a moment. Go to Isaiah 64. Let me show you some vines that used to be valued at a thousand shekels of silver. Why is it I never complete this message like I planned? When I'm at my house, I preach my sermons to myself. I preach myself this message in 30 minutes. 
And I don't know why I keep doing this. Y'all want to stay on this until Jesus comes? Amen. Good. I'm going to show what God will do to you. See, I will show him this morning that scripture he gave him in Zechariah. God really says, anyone that won't praise me, I will pour curses down upon him. Anyone that won't praise me. Now here's another one. Isaiah 64. Look what it says very clearly in your Bible, in the English language, so you can understand it. Wonder why the people of God today don't understand it? Verse 6, all of us have become, uh-oh, there's a word become again. That means we didn't get in that place. See, we all begin the same place. Blood washed, blood bought. Is that right? Yeah. Full of his life, full of his water. We have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. All of us weather like a leaf. You hear it all the time. I feel like giving it up. It's too hard. I want to quit. And our iniquity is like the wind just take us away. You hear it all the time. I'm just out of control. I just can't control myself. I used to bawl and boohoo with them. Now I'll simply say, when are you going to stop sinning? When are you going to call upon the Lord? Let me ask you a question. What happens? How in the world is it that someone, we sing this song this morning about greater is he that's in us, talked about it, than he that's in the world. Oh, we're, we're known to talk, but talk is cheap, isn't it? Amen. Folks, we come to a place where God is saying, shut up or put up. Or get us to How could that happen to these people? These are people of God. We're not reading about a bunch of prostitutes or, or crack salesmen. We're reading about God's people. Well, let's find out how does a person come to a place when he belongs to God, and all of a sudden his sins come right back on him, and he can't control himself. He goes berserk. Let me ask you a question. Is verse 7 in your Bible? Yes. Yes. Are you sure it's there? Yes. Okay. Would you please, if it's there, read it out loud to me, please? Yes. No one Notice this. Notice this. They're not looking on the one whom they bear. They're not looking to the waters. They ain't got time for prayer. I counsel businessmen every week. And when they get through telling about their problems they're going through and their marriage is a mess, they tell me. Nothing's going right and I'm earning all this money. <laughs> and I ask them about their prayer life. I ask them, how much time do you personally, sir, or ma'am, Spend in the word of God. What they tell me? I don't really have a lot of time. I'm so busy. My schedule is so loaded. And they want the blessings of God with minimum effort. It's insanity. America made this. Read the rest of that. I didn't mean to interrupt you being so rude there. Let me ask you a question. Who delivered us over to the power of our iniquities? I couldn't hear you. Who did that? See, we have a gospel today. God is love. See, let me tell you something. God is love. But he told us in Deuteronomy, his love is not a chapter. It's only for those that love him. He said, but those that hate me to my face, I'm going to repay them to their faces. You forgot what he said in John 3.20. Jesus said it. He said, everyone who does evil hates me. Amen. See, what God calls hatred, what I call hatred, is totally different. Jesus said it this way in John 14, also John 15, and also John 16. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Amen. Talk is cheap. Say with me, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. You can go to every church in America and say, how many love God? They're all green to their teeth are dry. I do. <laughs> Watch their life that week. See if they keep his commandments. And you'll see the fruit. Anger. Bing. Lust. Bing. Filthy imaginations. Bing. All kind of fruit popping up everywhere. 
And God is saying, abomination. Only the pure in heart will see God. Amen. God said in Genesis, I am sorry I made man. His imagination are continually evil. I want to read verse 7. There is no one in this bunch who calls upon thy name, who arouses himself. Pastor Walter talked about being on a spiritual slow for this and passivity. I have never seen it like this in all of my days in the gospel. Of people that know the things of God, that have begged them to continue to praise the Lord. But I remember what the Lord said in Matthew 24. The time will come when their love will wax cold. Instead they'll have hot love for lust of pleasures of the world, he said. Quoting what Paul wrote very clearly in 2 Timothy 4. Lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Amen. But Jesus said, but their love for God's going to wax cold. Who arouses himself. Number one excuse. I didn't feel like it. I was so tired. Couldn't arouse himself to take hold of thee. So what does God do? He says, I've hit my face from you. Guess what? Did Paul tell us the light of heaven is lit by the face that's in, by the glory and the radiance of the face of Jesus? Amen. If Jesus turns his face on us, guess what? Our light just went out. Amen. Amen. And when the light goes out, the darkness comes. Is that right? Amen. What's another name for darkness? Amen. Oh, them. Thou hast hidden thy face from us and hast delivered us, he says, into the power of our iniquities. You people just, just got saved, let me tell you something. You stay hot for Jesus. You keep running to Jesus. You make time for him every day. You spend time in his word every day. You speak in tongues daily Amen. until the water comes. I'm not talking about just a little gibberish that most of us do for 10 or 15 minutes of time. We may be praising the Lord in song. I'm talking about walking the floor for hours and talking to him in tongues. Until when you come down from that place, you try to talk in English, and it keeps coming out in tongues, glory to God. And every muscle be talking in English, but it keeps coming out in tongues. The river's flowing. You top the source, glory to God. Well, let's go one more place, please. <laughs> in the Genesis 3. <laughs> Here's where you get to the place. You move from the waters, and all you can produce are thorns and thistles. So it's quite a lesson. And by the way, aren't you glad to know that Adam made it to heaven? Remember I read the book last week to you? <laughs> oh, I kept saying, how did he make it there, Lord? They're done, done. What happened? You know, they, they accepted what the Lord provided for them. Remember that animal that was slain? That was the first time their blood was shed. Remember that? Yes. He accepted it, didn't he? Covered his neck in his didn't it? Amen. You know, he was one of those that Jesus preached to when he died. I mean, just sitting below. Folks, he didn't go burn in hell. He went and preached to all of those prophets, all those from eons of time that had been waiting for him to come. So we got so many heresies in the church today. It's incredible. Folks, Jesus never sinned, but he did not go into hell. Do you understand that? Amen. He died for our sins. In Genesis, the third chapter, verse 17, God is speaking to Adam about their sin. They're about to lose that place of water that God had prepared for them. Then the enemy said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and, and husbands, that don't mean you can't get any advice from your wife. Amen. Because I can take you to Genesis and show you that Abram was told by God, you better pay heed to what Sarah just told you. You kick out that bond woman and her son, Ishmael. And they ain't got a hill of beans with that scripture that Paul was talking about, the husband and wives, when he said, let the woman keep styling the church. Because he goes on and talks about a woman with her head uncut while she's prophesying, so if she's prophesying, that means she's preaching the gospel, amen? amen. Oh, uh, the things we do in this Bible, folks, it, it triggers me. How can a human brain with a brain come up with such nonsense? 
That's the problem. He gave us brains. <laughs> you know, we want to make it logical. It's incredible. In other words, she listened to rebellion of what he listened to. Is that right? You've eaten from the tree about which I command you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Now, this is what God says to him. Curse is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, but thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. Folks, is that in your Bible? Amen. There's a lesson there. Anything that man does does not produce the fruit of God as God produces it. Amen. Say with me. God must do everything in me. God must do everything in me. Why do you think he said we're his workmanship? Why do you think Jesus said it this way? I of my own self can do nothing. Why do you think the Lord said to us, laying aside every sin, every weight that's so easy to set us out, looking unto Jesus? What do you think he was talking about? He's got a picture of him and say, Hi, Jesus. I'm looking at all these sins, Jesus. No, you're saying, Jesus, I'm looking to you. Remove this out of my life, Jesus. Why do you think Peter wrote what he wrote in 2 Peter, 1 Peter 2? He turned the fourth verse. How you laid aside? Is he keep coming to Jesus? Keep coming back for more washing. Keep coming back for more of his presence. Because when we do it, all it produces is thorns and thistles. See, that's what the Jews are trying to do for years. Make God accept them because they're going to try to keep the Jewish law. That's why Paul wrote to him and told them, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It's by grace that those that have faith in Jesus, he said. Of course, he got his head chopped off, didn't he? Say with me. Anything that I'm doing, that I'm doing produce only thorns and thistles, thorns and thistles without God doing it. God. See, it's not by power of might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Is that right? Amen. He goes on to say, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. And you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Are those words also there in your Bible? Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. This was uh, <laughs> not something that they had planned to have happen to them. See, the lesson in this is that Satan will always tempt you and make you obey him, but he will never tell you the consequences of what you're doing to so great a salvation. Why do you think Paul gave us warning in Hebrews, the second chapter? First chapter talks about the angels of God that sent out to those that are heirs of salvation. He begins it, he ends up the first chapter with it in Hebrews 1. Begins in the second chapter, it says very clearly, about we better take heed that the things that we've heard begin to slip from us. Is that right? He warned us. Here's, the, here's what happened to them. Verse 21 is where God made something to cover them until Jesus comes. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Where do you think God got that skin from? An animal died for that, for that man's sin. Blood was shed. That's the first time that blood was shed. Pointing to Jesus who was to come. And I'm going to skip on down, please. The verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from where? The Garden, the Garden of Eden. Let me ask you a question. What was in that Garden of Eden when he was there? Everything he had needed. The gold was there, the pearls were there, the waters was there. All of a sudden, he's out from the garden. And what's amazing about this, there's another lesson. How many sins did Adam commit? One. Oh. The one we take sin so lightly. Now don't leave here saying, I said you commit one sin, you lost your salvation. I didn't say that, did I? No, no. I'm speaking in types and shadows of sin. How lightly we esteem sin. See, demons will tell us any goofy, off-the-wall thing to get us of our own will to make void our salvation. Here's one. Well, you know nobody's perfect. Just be willing. Here's another one. God don't see your sin. He just sees the blood. Folks, the eyes of God in every place What kind of places have you been taking God's eyes? That's what God says to them. Verse 23, the Lord, therefore the Lord God, 
sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. He's still working and he's still serving, but no longer in that prepared place. That place of such love and peace. That place where God did everything, just told him, <coughs> keep the fruit coming and keep the grass and the weeds out and don't obey anything else but me. Verse 24, so he drove the man out and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way. To guard the way. Glory to God. <laughs> Did you catch that? To guard the way to the tree of life. Who's the tree of life? Amen. Hey man, it sure is. In Hebrews 6, let me just give you this one. I mentioned it a while ago. Same thing, folks. What I just read to you is what Hebrews 6 is about. Did you know that? So here's one of these popular scriptures that preachers today will never teach. The other one is in Hebrews 10. It ain't kosher to bring those scriptures up. Especially now a day of once saved, always saved. You can't lose it. And God is love, 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 love. But forget, he is love. He's also God of judgment. Is that right? Amen. See, Hebrews 10 talks about we're going to sit in willfully. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. But he went on to say also, certain expectation of fiery judgment of a God whose wrath will consume his adversaries. Is that right? In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, notice with me in verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, they have tasted of the heavenly gift. Who is the heavenly gift? Jesus. Jesus. They have been made partners, partners, partakers, means partner of the Holy Spirit. They have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they, listen to me carefully, they again crucified to themselves. Now the King James Bible missed it and the New American Standard Bible also missed it also. Here's what that means. It's in the present participle verb of the Greek and what it literally says is it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they are crucifying. It means constantly crucifying and are putting to death, putting him to an open shame. That means every act of sin, listen to me. Let me ask you a question. If you're saved, wave at me. And since you've been saved, remember the first time you got saved, did you ever commit a sin? Wave at me again. Yeah, we all have. Now here's another one that's a little hard. Did you ever fall into a place where you found yourself committing the same sin over and over and over again until it came a bondage? Wave at me again. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Did you notice something? You notice the first time you fell into that hideous act, whatever it was, how old your heart just broke, how you hurt the Lord, and you realized it. But then the more you gave into it, the more you gave into it, the more you gave into it, I don't care if it was anger, I don't care if it was gossip, I don't care if it was slander, I don't care if it was lust, I don't care what it was, all of a sudden, you could do it with no fear of God whatsoever. You killed the conscience of God that God had placed within your innermost being. And we all did it. And you wonder what Paul meant when he said, if you bite and devour one another. A putting him to an open shame. Putting him to death. Now, what this really means is, as long as you're walking in a lifestyle, well, you know that you're committing sin and know that you're not going to break it and know that you ain't ready to turn from it. God, that he says, you don't get more water. <laughs> uh, let's, let's keep reading. I'm going to take it out of your five. See, people don't believe this. <laughs> Verse seven. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls upon it, let me ask you a question. Are you hearing the word of God today? Amen. Talk to me. Are you understanding the word of God today? Amen. Okay. Did you know you're drinking in the rain? Yes. 
Okay. By the way, is God talking about a, a garden here? Who's the ground? We are. we are the ground. That drinks the rain, you might want to put that, that hears the word, which often falls upon it, and brings forth vegetation. Vegetation is the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, excuse me. Useful to those for whom sacred is also still. They receive a blessing from God. Now, for all you once saved, always saved lovers, you'll love verse 8. But if it yields thorns and thistles, uh, the thorns and thistles are the fruit of the flesh that's listed in Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, and Ephesians 4. And that's what Jesus meant over there in Matthew 7 when he said, You will know them by their fruit, and many will stand before me in that day, saying, Lord, in your name, we prophesy, we cast out demons, we perform many miracles. Jesus said out of his own mouth, talking about his people, I will say to many, I never knew you. Depart from me, your work was in iniquity. You that practice sin, live in Bible, you that practice lawlessness. You're yielding thorns and thistles. Every act of rebellion is a thorn and a thistle. Are oh, you understanding that? Amen. That's what all of God's commandments are about. They keep bringing you right back to that place of Pishon, Palabah. And the flesh says, I hate it. Why? Because our flesh married Satan and man failed. If I keep telling you, our flesh is a demon. Amen. We come to verse 8. But if it is thorns and thistles, it is what? Worthless. Worthless. And close to being what? Cursed. Cursed. And it ends up being what? Burned. Burned. Did I show you last Sunday night that when the river is not there, the demons march on like soldiers? And there is no stopping them. What stops them is the river, the presence, the rain. <laughs> That's what Joel is all about. That's what Joel's army is about. <coughs> Go back and we read that book. You'll understand it now. Uh, I'm going to show you this. I don't have it planned, but I need to show you. I need to stop wrestling against God sometime because God knows who needs to hear this stuff and just preach it even though he gave me the message. Let him be the orchestra conductor, amen, and not this piece of flesh. I move my flesh out the way, Lord. Speak on. Isaiah 5. Go with me there for a moment. I get myself in these rushes sometimes trying to complete a message when I want to complete it. We're just there until Jesus comes. We have to. Amen? Amen. Now verse 4 and verse chapter 4 and, and chapter 5 should be read together. Because chapter 4 is about the remnant. And those that's living at Holiba, the river, Pishon. Okay? Chapter 5 is all those that came to know Jesus and decided that a little sin would be all right. Chapter 5 has absolutely nothing at all to do with the rotten, slimy center of the world. Chapter 5 is written to the people of God. And God does something through Isaiah. He speaks in the first person. And when Jesus spoke, he used all the language of the Old Testament prophets. Are you listening to me? Amen. Every one of his parables was in the language of the Old Testament prophets. That's why nobody can understand them. The parables are glorious. You see, again, we live in a day where people say, we don't need the Old Testament. We just need the new one. We're on the grace. They lied to you. Acts 3 has not been cut out of your Bible. Acts 3, 17 through 26. Romans 15, 4. 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 11. Are you listening to me? Ephesians, the second chapter, will tell you continuously. Your foundation must be the prophets of the Old Testament. Amen. They will tell you continuously that every prophet wrote to us living today. <laughs> and so these people walk around and they, they, make, they go to these Bible bookstores and buy these butchered Bibles. You know, that's the one that's got just the New Testament in it and Psalms and Proverbs. The prophets contain the fear of God. And you wonder why we keep raising up these marshmallow Christians of America. Isaiah 5. In your Bible. And you know what's amazing about this, this chapter? Jesus gave <coughs> three major parables from this fifth chapter of Isaiah. Major ones. Well, I better not pursue that course any longer because, folks, 
we won't we get stuck on Isaiah 5 the rest of the time today. You remember the parable that Jesus gave? Let me give you an example. A body came looking for some fruit on a tree. You remember that? And then he said, he didn't find any. And then he spoke and said, cut it down. Why does it even use it the ground? And the mercy of God spoke and said, let me give it another year. Now I'm paraphrasing because what it is says in your Bible is, let it alone, sir. Let me dung around it and dig around it this year, sir. If it bears fruit, fine. If not, cut it down. And we keep saying we can't lose it. See, that brings in Romans, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, God. This is a wild day. And I'm down to two minutes, is that right? Oh, dear Lord. Let's close with Isaiah 5. This is what it says. Let me sing now for my well-beloved. A song of my beloved. Who's the beloved? Jesus. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I will please. Oh, yeah. Concerning his vineyard. Who's the vineyard? We are, we are the church. My well-beloved, that's Jesus, had a vineyard, that's us, on a fertile hill, that's God's kingdom, the place of the rivers. He dug it all around. Original says he put a fence around it. That's the hedge of protection. He moved its stones. The stones are the hard place of the heart. The sin habits, the bondages. He planted with the choicest vine. The choicest vine is the character and the nature of Jesus. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Is that right? Yes. This is so simple, isn't it? Even if someone in kindergarten can understand this. He built a tower in the middle of it. Proverbs says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they'll save. What does it mean? It means when I'm living the right way, Jesus, deliver me. He comes. I have his name. He does something else. After the tower, he put a wine vat in it. You know that? He put on a wine vat in it. The wine vat is the Holy Spirit. Then he expected it to produce good grapes. Grapes is always the symbol of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, meekness, goodness, temperance, faith, faithfulness, and self control. He did all these things, gave us his name, gave us his life, his character and nature, and expected us to produce his character. But it produced only worthless ones. Worthless ones are the fruit of the flesh. And he continues. He says, Oh now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, Hebrews 12 says, When we come to Jesus, we come to the heaven of Jerusalem. And men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard I have not done in it? Why, when I expected to produce good grapes, did it produce only worthless ones? So let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. Jesus is doing the talk in the first person of Isaiah. He, Jesus says to him, I will remove its what? Hedge. Did Job have a hedge around him? Amen. When the hedge was removed, who got a hold of Job? Amen. If Jesus removed the hedge from around you and around me, what do you think is going to hold of us? Amen. How do you think it talks about he delivers us over to the power of our iniquities? What do you think has happened to you when you find yourself going right back to the same filthy, perverted life that God delivered us from and you can't seem to control it? Don't you know the hair's been removed? Amen. Don't you know that you're no longer a cabin by Pishon? But you got a different place? You're in the swamps and the marshes that we looked at last week that Ezekiel talked about? What is with the people who know that they're in bondage to sin? They won't cry out to God to deliver them. But instead, they keep running behind some man with some power. Don't you know that Deuteronomy 28 stares you in your face every time you jump in a healing line and you're unwilling to cry out to God for yourself? Amen. God says, I will send these things on you and no one will chase them away. You can send your money in and they can get a hundredfold and everything else and get pieces of material. Whatever you want to, until you cry to God, deliver me, and look on the one whom we pass, the water will not be restored. Amen. Say with me, it's holiness, it's, holiness. it's, righteousness. it's righteousness, it's godliness, it's, godliness. it's, sanctification. it's sanctification, it's practicing righteousness. It's practicing righteousness. It's practicing righteousness. It's righteousness. Without it, there's only hell to expect. You know what one businessman told me in Dallas? I know Mike, you know some people in Dallas. He said, when I'm making all the money, I just tell my wife to pray for me. I'll make it to heaven through her prayers. Because you know the scripture says, 
The ungodly husband is sanctified by his wife. I said, when you stand before him, sir, your wife will make it in, but you're going to bust the bottom of hell wide open. I lost a friend. A friend. But I didn't lose the friend who was Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's continue. I will break down its wall. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. It will become trampled ground. You see, he said, I will give you power to turn on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. All of a sudden, something's trampling on you. A man told me very clearly, listen to me. I've talked to many people like this. I got a little, last week in the mail, this brother was telling me very clearly what he was going through. He said, I go to sleep at night, demons are touching me. He said, one sits on my chest and just presses me down. See, people don't believe in this kind of stuff. I told the time they came around my bed and sitting on like a bunch of Indians surrounding me. And I was crying out to God, God, where are you? You had left me. See, people don't believe in this kind of stuff. So I'm going to tell you again, you know how I learned this stuff? I've been now held in back. Let's not care what any man thinks. Because God had to bring me back. And that's when he unlocked the scriptures to me. Let me hurry up. I was down for two minutes. <laughs> Listen to this, folks. This is, this is awesome. He says, I'm going to do this in my vineyard, verse 7. I will lay it waste. It won't be pruned or hold. But briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to do what with it? Rain. rain, rain. No rain on it. Is it there? Skip on down with me for a moment. And let's see what we're talking about. Look at verse 13. What's the first word in verse 13? Therefore. What does therefore mean? Something to everything written above. Therefore, what's the next two words? Mind. Wait a minute. Did it say that Roger Slater, the crack salesman, the prostitute, the homosexual? Who did it say? Mind. My people, what? Oh, do you know where exile is? Where is the place called exile? It's out of his presence. It's in prison. God had me in prison for two and a half years, nonstop. Oh, you're listening, doesn't they? He says, therefore, my people go into exile for their lack of what? No. Knowledge. Which means they don't know God. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know God either. I know about God. I'm asking God to be knowing. Jesus said it best. Uh -huh. He's going to him to whom the Father reveals himself. Amen. Let me tell you a little secret. As long as you're still playing with sin, you don't know God. You know maybe some facts about God. You don't have a whole picture yet. You play with sin, you're a fool, God says. They're honorable men. That means the preachers they listen to. God says they are famished. How about that church's multitude? He says, and their multitude is parched with what? Thirst. Thirst. They're not getting any water either. Well, what's going to happen to these people? Then we got another therefore. Two therefores back to back. God sums up one thing, makes a statement, then he sums this one up. He says, therefore, Sheol has done what? Enlarged, enlarged its throat or enlarged itself. Folks, what is Sheol? Hell. 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 Open its mouth without measure, and Jerusalem splendor. What is Jerusalem splendor? The church. Her multitude. The church's congregation. Her den of reverie. You know how every church today was praising God. I hope. That was some music going forth. The den of reverie. Praising. Jubilant. Happy. Music. Psalms. And the jubilant within her. Where do they go? They sin where? Into it. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Did you know that this is happening right now? Yes. See, I hope you guys remember the principle of interpretation of the, of the word. <laughs> Whenever God talks about one thing, 
There's also the other side of the coin happening at the same time. There's always two streams flowing continuously right beside one another. Because while this is going on, there's also some people that God is reaching out to and bringing them to eat. Listen to me. In fact, let me just show you that now. Close. Now you people know why I like like Bible schools a little bit better. We can stay there all day long and nobody cares, you know. The Lord says very clearly in verse 16, But the Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment. Exalted in what? Did your Bible say love or judgment? judgment. What do you think is happening with all these people falling and failing and, and slipping and sliding? God has said, I'm going to be mocked, but you so you're going to reap. And the holy God will show himself holy in what? Righteousness. That means all the judgment that comes is God's righteous judgment. Say with me. Thank you, Lord, for all your judgments. Thank you, Lord, for all your judgments. I'll tell you, that's one way to come out real quick. You know most do? They grumble and complain, and they run trying to find up some man with some power. Let me help you. Ain't no man got no power that's in your Bible. Power comes from God and God.